I would like to welcome all the delegates to the second day of the virtual call the conference. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed the first day and are ready for more exciting lectures on the second and third days, uh, abstract presentations and many more. So now I would like to uh, introduce the second session and the uh, first speaker. And the second session will be on management of viral hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B related. And our first speaker uh, will be Dr. Uh, Haley Mikael uh, Dessalin from St. Paul's Hospital Millennium Medical College, Ethiopia, presenting on management of hepatitis B virus test and treat strategy. Uh, Dr. Dessalin is an associate professor and consultant gastroenterology and pathology in St. Paul's Hospital Millennium Medical College. Uh, as one of the few gastroenterologists in his country of more than 100 million individuals, he has a passion to translate research findings to improvements in the access and quality of care and simplified approach for hepatitis in resource limited settings. Okay, thank you for the collab 2020 for uh, giving me this chance. It's an honor to present on this virtual conference on liberties in Africa. So my topic will be on hepatitis B virus test and treat strategy. So I have nothing to disclose. So my aim in this uh, presentation will be, I'll try to discuss the burden of hepatitis B virus infection and the challenges to implement to the uh, WHO guideline and to reach the ambitious goal of uh, elimination of hepatitis B in 2013. And I'll try to discuss the characteristics of patients which I have seen with HCC in our cohorts. And I'll present the cascade of care and the recommendations for, for test and treatment strategy. So we know this hepatitis uh, B virus and hepatitis B C virus with the current mode of treatment and care, it will be the number one cause of uh, infectious disease surpassing tuberculosis, HIV and malaria even more. Uh, if, 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 you are, if you are not doing much effort to control these infections. So even in Ethiopia, we are um, located with a population of around 109 Point two million people are in as this in this slide. It's the uh, most populous country second to Nigeria and with the estimated prevalence of hepatitis B from a recent meta-analysis was 7.4%. From another study uh, which, in which each country has been presented as I've been shown, it's around 9.4%. And I, I put some red spots with the countries or cities with the highest prevalence of infection. I just put same so that we can identify the most common risk factors that are important also for the prevention of uh, hepatitis B virus infection. And the, from the global estimate, the task force for hepatitis elimination, they say that around 6,348 people has uh, modeled like days of hepatitis B virus in 2019. That means around one days occurs every hour actually. So when combined to other African countries and other low and middle income countries, this number is really, is really high still. And this ambitious goal to treat hepatitis B, uh, uh, eliminate viral hepatitis as a public health treat, it has also a guideline as you know, and uh, the plan is, so we are in 2020 and we are 10 years uh, to the 2030 elimination plan and this is a time to see how the program, the progress of the testing, treatment of hepatitis B virus infection up to now and what will happen to the next 10 years. Actually with this COVID pandemic the WHO actually has planned, actually probably will change the, this elimination target, this ambitious target, but we'll see what has been done from here and can we really achieve that with the uh, with this guideline. So the most important problems that I want to discuss is from this guideline are the problems like in the staging and non-invasive tests in which non-invasive tests are preferred to assess for the presence of cirrhosis. And then the APRI score or viral DNA which has been used as a treatment criteria. And also we can see that still viral DNA very important. And also we can see for the monitoring also viral DNA, E antigen and APRI has been recommended as a treatment. So I'll try to uh, mention this WHO guideline and to question 
how it fails, I mean, in, in low and middle income countries, how we fail to uh, manage or the problems with these uh, different uh, recommendations. So if, if you just start, when you have a patient with hepatitis B virus, the problem starts from the screening. Which individuals, or who are individuals likely to be screened? So we know we can use a diagnosis of diagnostic from antenatal care visits, a blood bank, immigration, patients with symptoms, chronic liver disease patients could be important. But as I've said, from those red spots, for example, in the country, we can see what are the common practices that those cities are using. So we have seen that, for example, female genital mutilation and also hospital births, low hospital births, or like births in the home base are important risk factors that you find for those infections. And also doing a meta-analysis are also important to know which individuals are here to be screened so that we can find the missing millions. So from this meta-analysis, these are the most important risk factors, for example, for the infection in Ethiopia, like who has history of abortion, HIV co-infection, multiple sexual partners, history of piercing, sharp material. So traditional scarifications, which are common practice for treatment and previous birth transmission. So this could be important. So countries should, uh, should study actually their risk factors for head infection too, so that they can reach to a higher level which individuals to be screened. And then comes the diagnosis and then the liver fibrosis assessment. If it was easy, then you you'd have a treatment and one big problem that you also see for all this in low and middle income countries, patients are paying out of pocket payments and this will be difficult with the, with the high viral load uh, diagnostic test and also the treatment is actually now decreasing if you are uh, mobilizing the generic uh, drugs to be available. So in the staging and NITs, we have seen these studies and from other studies, the recommended tests like APRI, FIV4, and also the GPR were not sensitive. And it had been seen that like the, the APRI in this study has a lower sensitivity of around 10%. The same occurs like in the West Africa and also other studies like, uh, which is around 25% or uh, around 20 So it misses, so if we rely only on APRI, it misses many patients that in need of treatment. And um, so we need to have other tests like the, probably the uh, other tests that depends on E antigen and ALT might be an important uh, non-invasive test, probably better than this test to diagnose uh, fibrosis. And we have shown that the WHO guidelines has failed to detect many patients. The main thing is looking at the character, baseline characteristics of our patients, like 90% uh, were having E antigen negative and we can see that genotype A was present in around 85%, and the co-infection rate was, uh, hep delta was around 1.4% from this cohort, and also for hep C, it was around 2.7%. You can see the different parameters. Patients are having even uh, lower ALT, as you see, 81.3%, and uh, APRI was present, like, more, more than two was in only, like, 2.6% of these individuals. So if you use APRI alone, uh, we can we miss 50% of patients. That means patients with significant fibrosis that's detected on transient elastography or 48% of patients with cirrhosis has been missed if we rely on only and the APRI criteria of uh, at least two. So, uh, so and then we see HCC patients from the cohort of studies. So this is a cohort of like uh, this, for example, a three years cohort. And I have the, well, so we have found around 17 patients from this course of study. And one patient is only alive after the three years. This patient was having a small size of the liver tumor. I want to characterize what kind of patients we have in this patient with hepatocellular cancer. So these seven patients were diagnosed and the smallest age, youngest age was 26 years of age and with the median of 48 years of age. This is actually lower than the other affluent countries. Cases were diagnosed within 12 months of treatment, as you see, and the median ALT was 42%. And, um, uh, and viral load, if you rely on viral load of more than 20,000, 41.2% were having a viral load of less than 20,000, and 70% were having a viral load of greater than 2,000. And you can see that uh, many of the patients were having either a higher 
size of the liver tumor or multiple liver tumors, which are not peaked with ultrasound ring alpha beta protein, because we have seen that these values were less sensitive to peak such kind of tumors. So these individuals were found through follow up, through one year of follow up, and ultrasound NF was not also sensitive in these patients. And we have seen 76.5 per percent rate of being either a large or a multiple tumors. And treatment options are also limited once the diagnosis is an affordable once a patient has HCC. And one patient with compliance, uh, failure of compliance or non-compliance develop HCC on the follow-up period of time. So we, we, we can see that the median ALT is low. We can see a patient can develop hepatocellular carcinoma even at a lower viral load level, younger age, and uh, viral load, and we can see that most of the patients were having E antigen negative. So the guidelines actually cannot pick these individuals, and we need to have uh, a different, I mean, a better guidelines that pick these patients at early age before they develop hepatocellular cancer. So this is a, a prospective court study just to show, and this is that we try to also decentralize. Decentralization to care can be pos is possible in patients with hepatitis B, like patients once you characterize them, if you really diagnose inactive carriers, then it can be decentralized to the like a study nurse or health officers can be do the follow-up. And patients who need treatment, once the physicians has reached a treatment decisions, then the follow-up can be also decentralized. And we can put like the red flags, pain to consult. Uh, otherwise, the refill, the follow-up can also be done. So such kind of um, decentralization are very important to, to reach the elimination targets. And this was what we are using because the non invasive cases were not strong enough. We have used uh, fibro scan values actually to, uh, to use to diagnose compensated cirrhosis or a significant stiffness from the fibro scan value. And uh, we also added uh, first degree related family history of uh, hepatocellular cancer. As we see, many of individuals are having cancer, and the African patients are also having a poor prognosis. So we added family history of cancer as an important uh, uh, criteria for treatment. And um, another important thing that I want to discuss is that predictors of virological failure, it was diagnosed as 69 actually, after one year of treatment. This is just to strengthen the importance of adherence. So we used the previous uh, pharmacy refill data that had been used for the HIV. So based on that pharmacy refill uh, pill count, we have assessed that if the adherence is less than 95%, there is significant you know, statistical significant difference in biological failure, but we have assessed that this patient, there is no drug resistance and patients could have actually depend on, may have high viral load after the, even after a year, but the, it doesn't mean the fail of treatment or resistance. We have checked that there is no resistance, but we need to strengthen on that. And the other predictor was the initial viral load level, which is very high or than 10 raised to 6 was also significant. One thing that I want to show is also patients with uh, predictors of mortality has been published uh, and we have seen that uh, we have added BMI. BMI, it, you know, it doesn't come just by chance. Uh, we have seen that BMI has been the initial predictor of uh, like child, it has been used in the child food stage from the initial times. And when you see our ind individuals with low BMI when we see that they are having associated poor prognosis, which is statistically significant. We want to use that. So age, low BMI, and also decompensative cirrhosis were the most important predictors of mortality, which was significant because the BMI with adjusted hazard ratio of 3.65. This has been main implications because patients with viral hepatitis are denied a protein diet when they come, and these patients even with the viral hepatitis diagnosis that's uh, by the physicians or by their uh, due to like different uh, advice that are being given to these patients they are devoid of protein that when they come it's they have having low BMI. So it shows that this is also one predictor of mortality. So it can, it helps us to uh, reach main individuals to train to educate them that patients should maintain a good BMI when they with their diagnosis. And once a uh, patient having low BMI or decompensation and increasing age they can, we need to give them a due emphasis so that we can improve their outcome by aggressive management when we find these patients. So 
uh, it's clearly shows in this Kaplan mirror term, you can see survival with the different BMI values. And this graph is showing the compensated and decompensated. It looks obvious that patients with decompensated could fail, have a poor prognosis. But one thing that I want to stress is patients with decompensated cirrhosis, if we uh, are aggressive in the management, like we have done for patients managing their ascites, their bleeding, their nutrition. So those who survived the first six months, even with decompensated cirrhosis, like more than two thirds, those who survive after this two thirds, still are alive and having a good follow-up. So we need to strengthen, we need to strengthen our care within the first six months. Still patients with decompensated cirrhosis can have a poor prognosis if they survive the initial times. So the other option in the treatment is a taste and treat strategy. Uh, so the Prolifica have shown that if there is high coverage of community-based screening and a good linkage to care, only proportionally required treatment. So with this, I will try to show the cascade of care. So in, as a holistic approach, the birth dose is a very important as a prevention schedule. Then as I've said, we need to know who the individuals who needs to be screened and to find the missing millions from a different aspect. As I have shown the risk factor assessment or selective adult vaccination from uh, meta-analysis studies or if possible, doing like a large survey might, might be important in finding the right spots. And how, so from rural areas, it may be difficult. So I will try to show that DBS usage for uh, diagnosing and then also then sending for viral assessment from remote areas. And then the most important thing is linkage to care. So these are studies showing that DBS as a reliable method of measurement of hepatitis B viral load in the resource limiting setting. So it can be a feasible and really a reliable alternative. And then we need to have a linkage to care. One problem, as I've said, is a viral load in the fibrous can could be still a problem. I will have only two slides on the need of expansion of the treatment criteria. Immune to run patients, I found this from Henry E. Chang, we can see that patients in the immune tolerant phase with the current knowledge, there is a highly likely chance of hepatitis B viral DNA integration and hepatitis B viral specific T cell immune response and clonal hepatocyte expansion and patients even in immune tolerant, if there are risk factors like older age and signs of liver fibrosis, they need to treatment, they need to be treated. So otherwise there is no evidence that support treatment in other immune tolerance or if there is confirmed in active care. So the treatment guidelines should be modified by having more data from different countries. And uh, this is my final slide. So what do I recommend in general is the current indications for treatment. I mean, it's, it needs to be modified and uh, collaborative studies should be done so that we can, we need to modify including the WHO guideline and relying on the blood-based non-invasive tests miss main patient need of treatment. So patient comes with hepatitis B virus. If you are relying on APRI or other non-invasive tests, which are still not, uh, not good enough because patients with hepatitis B will come with cancer. So we are missing many patients that need treatment. So uh, this is very important. Relying on blood-based tests miss the main patients. And the other things like a viral load and ASP test hampers the treatment decision. So point of care tests of the viral load and a antigen now we are, we are trying to study HEP antigen with ALT as a point of care test to, to diagnose cirrhosis. So such kind of collaborative studies might be important. And from our side, we have seen that eight BMI ascites, BMI didn't come by chance, BMI has been used as an important uh, predictor from the initial child book stage. Child book stage currently use INR and bilirubin, which most of the rural areas do not have. So we need to have uh, guidelines based on our local capacity. And if we want to increase treatment coverage to 80%, a simplified screening and treatment strategies are important. With this, I would like to thank the CODA for, for giving me this chance to present. And thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dessaline, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, and now I'm introducing myself, um, uh, Manal El Said, I'm a professor of pediatrics uh, and director of the Clinical Research Center at the Faculty of Medicine, Ain Shams University in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, I'm a founding member of the Egyptian National Committee for Control of Viral Hepatitis since 2006. 
and developed the whole program for test and treat and elimination of hepatitis C in adults and children, and also contributed to all WHO's uh, test and treat guidelines for hepatitis B and C, and uh, have been a board member of the European Study of Liver Disease International Liver Foundation uh, since uh, 2018. The title of my presentation will be Management of Hepatitis B Virus in Children. So in my presentation, I will be discussing the epidemiology of hepatitis B in children, prevention of mother-to-child transmission of hepatitis B, some research gaps in hepatitis B and pregnancy, particularly in Africa, diagnostic challenges, and the way forwards. So if we look at viral hepatitis in Africa, around 5 to 8% of the population, mainly in West and Central Africa, are infected with hepatitis B, and around 2 million are co-infected with HIV as well. However, the situation of hepatitis delta is poorly understood. Hepatitis B in children is really important from a clinical perspective and a public health perspective. Clinically, infants are mostly asymptomatic. They will have normal ALTs. Uh, they, we do not usually screen pregnant women and we need to diagnose them in the setting of pregnant women screening. Uh, the birth dose vaccination uh, coverage globally is fairly poor and progression of liver disease in the high risk and immune compromised populations of children are high. And there is also a risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, particularly in adolescents. From the public health point of view, children can transmit infections, particularly those with high viral loads and immune tolerance. Uh, virus suppression as prevention is very important uh, during the adolescent phase where there is high risk behavior. And globalization immigration allowed a lot of infected children to infect populations who were uh, having a lower prevalence of hepatitis B. And there is also lack of screening policies for both children and women in childbearing age. And indeed, global elimination of hepatitis B is not possible if we do not include children and women in childbearing age. 1.2 million adolescents aged 10 to 19 uh, live among us uh, globally, making up around 16% of the world's population. And if we look at the African population, 40% to 50% are below the age of 25 years. There is also something critical about infection in children, the fact that chronic infection is much higher the younger the ages. So those who are infected from their mothers have a risk of almost 90% of being infected uh, with having chronic infection with hepatitis B, particularly those uh, uh, born to E antigen positive mother, and the risk is lower as the children grow older. If we look at the global burden of hepatitis B in children and adolescents below the age of 18, it's estimated to be around 50 million infected below the age of 18 years. Those are not captured, are not known, and they are transmitters of disease. Only 84% of countries vaccinate the three doses of hepatitis B, and 39% only vaccinate also the birth dose. The S antigen, though, because of the vaccination, dropped uh, from 4.5% uh, to 1.3% uh, in the vaccination era from 2000 through 2015. Uh, this is the S antigen prevalence uh, coming from all countries with data modeling or, extrapolate, or extrapolations uh, from those five years uh, old. And as we can see, the Western and Central Africa have the highest prevalence rates above 2% in children below the age of five, with a little bit of a lower prevalence, uh, up to 2% in the southern part of Africa, and it's less than 1% in North Africa. As we can see that the coverage of the three doses is up to 80% in Africa of the hepatitis B. Uh, for the birth dose, the coverage is no more than 10%, and there is no coverage for the hepatitis B immunoglobulin or the prenatal the uh, prophylaxis for uh, pregnant women. The situation of Delta also in children is completely unknown, except very few case reports uh, with either super or co-infections. 
So according to the WHO Afro region, only 15% of the countries are leading prevention efforts and are vaccinating, giving the birth dose with the pentavalent vaccination of more than 90% coverage. Less than eight countries provide the subsidized testing and treatment and the birth dose in early infancy, as we know, is the most effective way to prevent transmission. It has a very low cost to prevent mother to child transmission. It's less than 20 cents per child. Only 11 countries in the region are following this protocol, including Cabo Verde has almost achieved more than 99% vaccination with those coverage. If we look at the mother to child transmission, uh, those mothers who are E antigen, S antigen positive have a possibility of 90% transmitting the infection to their infants, while uh, those who are uh, E antigen negative have five to 20% possibility of transmitting the infection. But most of the mothers who have prophylaxis failures, these occur at thresholds of maternal DNA levels of 10 to the six to 10 to the eight copies per mil. But those are uh, some of the pooled studies for E antigen positive and negative women uh, from 11 African countries looking at the pooled risk of a little bit of a lower risk uh, without prophylaxis of 38% for the E antigen positive mothers and 4.8% pooled risk for the E antigen negative mothers with around 360,000 HPV infected uh, infants uh, perinatally in sub Saharan Africa. How about intrauterine transmission? It has been proven, particularly in mothers who are E antigen positive with only the structural HBV protein that can pass through the placenta is the E antigen. Sometimes with amniocentesis, transmission can happen. But the majority of transmissions happen intrapartum, uh, where the mother to child transmissions, there's some mucosal breaks, uh, microtransfusions, hematologic leaks during delivery or interventional delivery. Um, and sometimes with the electrodes in infants that the transmission can happen, but there is no difference between vaginal and C-section. So we should not expose mothers to a higher risk of cesarean section uh, to prevent hepatitis B because it has no role in reducing the risk of mother to child transmission. Breastfeeding uh, uh, has no role or minimal role, uh, particularly only in mothers who have cracked nipples. Uh, however, with proper prophylaxis, uh, breast milk should not transmit uh, hepatitis B. So if the mothers are given treatment, uh, we give HBIG or without even, and give the timely birth dose, uh, it should not, uh, uh, this should prevent the mother to child transmission. And we should not uh, prevent breastfeeding, which is really important, particularly in low and low middle income countries. The natural history of hepatitis B in children is very unique. Neonates are mostly asymptomatic, but some of them might present with fulminant hepatitis. However, a very unique uh, uh, condition of the skin called genotic cross T syndrome, a papillar acrodermatitis might present in some of the infants above the age of six months, uh, in addition to young children. And they usually have mild fever, lymphadenopathy. They usually don't have jaundice. And in children and adolescents, however, there might be mild constitutional symptoms and occasionally and very uh, rarely actually fulminant hepatitis, but we might encounter extra hepatic manifestations like membranous glomerulonephritis and sometimes rapid progression of liver disease in children, particularly those who are immune compromised, uh, or those with cancer, thalassemias, blood diseases, etc. Cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma happen in around one to 3% and hepatocellular carcinoma risk is one over 1,000 per year. We've seen adolescents with hepatocellular carcinoma. Spontaneous clearance of E antigen uh, uh, can happen more in Western children, lower in the Asian population, and there is a difference in the background of immune response. Uh, the E antigen seroconversion rate is around four to 10 percent annual rate up to 70 percent by the end of adolescence and we have a minimal zero to one percent annual rate of S antigen loss E antigen positivity. The Asian population particularly those perinatally infected are less likely to uh, uh, clear the hepatitis B and there is more active disease beyond adolescence and more favorable evolution particularly in females of genotype 
uh, be. Uh, this is a natural history study of a 25 years experience of 252 antigen positive cases, 50 more than fit, almost 60% uh, had infected mothers, 77% were Asians, 33 received interferon. E0 conversion rate was 41.7% over almost a 19 years period of follow up. But there are many changing concepts of immune tolerance and chronic hepatitis. First, we have the easy classification, the new classification for E antigen positive chronic infection, then chronic hepatitis, E antigen negative chronic infection, then chronic hepatitis, and, and the S antigen negative. The majority of children have high viral loads, but they have normal transaminases, the so called immune tolerant chronic hepatitis B. It's not always innocent. Some of them, uh, we, uh, it has been recently known that some of those uh, immune tolerant cases might have high replicative low inflammatory disease with substantial histological lesions. So, and DNA integration. So liver biopsy in some cases might be still indicated, particularly in the so-called immune tolerant population. And the majority of those are the childhood and adolescent population. This is an example uh, of a five years old child with chronic hepatitis B, elevated transaminases for more than six months, E antigen positive, S antigen positive, DNA, more than 3.7 times 10 to the eight international units per mil, uh, previous infection with hepatitis A, ultrasound showing bright liver. Uh, liver biopsy showed minimal inflammation, mild portal fibrosis, but also 5% only as antigen positivity and less than 1% core antigen positivity as a nuclear reaction. And in fact, the uh, brilliant pathologist told me weight is going to clear the virus. And within uh, less than one year, this child completely cleared the virus and was S antigen negative and antibody positive, anti S positive. And that uh, was uh, uh, really uh, very rewarding. And the liver biopsy here was uh, really rewarding because uh, this child did not receive treatment and spontaneously cleared the virus. So those are the treatment recommendations in children uh, for those who are E antigen positive, aged between two and 18, with both elevated ALT, measurable HBV DNA, with the goal of achieving E antigen zero conversion. ALT elevations more than 1.3 times upper normal limit at least six months with uh, HBV DNA elevation. However, we usually wait longer, especially if you have the expertise you know sometimes that those children might clear the virus and you can wait a little bit longer, particularly if they have normal fibro scans or normal uh, uh, liver biopsies. Uh, DNA levels are very high, more than 10 to the six international units per mil. If they're a little bit lower, we can even wait longer. Interferon uh, alpha 2b is approved for children one year old and above. Uh, lam lamivudine and entecavir approved for children two years and above antenofovir approved for children 12 years and above. Duration of interference is usually 24 weeks, but oral antivirals, uh, they've been followed up after four years and even six years. I have children and adolescents and they became adults now who have been on treatment for 15 to 20 years. E antigen zero conversion once happens, we wait 12 months for consolidation and then we stop treatment. However, we continue following up for every three months for uh, ALT flares or uh, for reactivation of the virus. So to control hepatitis B in children, uh, we need surveillance, proper infection control practices that has been recently strengthened by the COVID-19 crisis, improving blood safety, timely birth dose, uh, hepatitis B birth dose to prevent mother to child transmission. Education and awareness are key. Uh, particularly among pregnant women, among pediatricians, among healthcare providers, obstetricians, and gynecologists. Uh, research is gender for the gaps, very important. And uh, we use treatment as prevention sometimes to suppress the virus in those who are eligible for treatment to prevent progression of liver disease and remove the stigma and discrimination among children, particularly in schools and uh, in, uh, when they play sports. Also prevent reactivation of the S antigen in the immune suppressed and compromised population and prevent transmission of the virus in the high risk population and indeed prevent mother to child transmission.
So the dilemma is that the only approved drugs and antivirals are entecavir for children above two and tenofovir above 12. However, these are not accessible in most of the countries because the syrup for entecavir is not available. And if we have a smaller child who needs treatment, uh, probably the treatment will not be available except in a tablet form. For research, there are many trials now for also the TAF, uh, the tenofovir uh, al uh, alafenamide, and the uh, TAF uh, has been used in HIV uh, in adolescents and children, and it's being tried now in adolescents with chronic hepatitis B. And there are studies also for entecavir and pegylated interferon for the immune tolerant population, but the results are not very rewarding. So what are the strategies for prevention, maternal screening, of course, a timely birth dose, birth dose within the first 24 hours, and hepatitis B immunoglobulin, if available with completion of the hepatitis B vaccination courses, and of course, using the antivirals for women who are at a higher risk with high viral loads. But when we look closely at prevention of mother to child transmission, we will find that this is really important that we start treatment of mothers a little bit earlier or in the last trimester of pregnancy. Because as you see from the right side, that transmission can happen in utero. And also because of the fact that it can cause preterm birth, low birth weight, premature rupture of membranes, gestational diabetes, possible small increase in congenital anomalies. And those uh, are some of the pregnancy outcomes that have been reported. And there are many studies looking at the effect of drugs during an antiviral therapy during pregnancy, and tenofovir has been the winner for use in mothers in the last trimester of pregnancy. So those are the advisory committee for immunization practices, maternal screening recommendations. Uh, mothers um, should be tested for S antigen at the first antenatal visit and should be tested again for S antigen, even if negative earlier. If she had more than one sex partner in the previous six months, uh, had an evaluation or treatment for sexually transmitted disease, was an injecting drug user, had an S antigen positive sex partner, or was diagnosed with clinical hepatitis since the last visits. And WHO highlighted very clearly that despite some interventions like vaccinations and among all reasons for vertical transmission, high maternal viral load was the key cause for maternal transmission despite interventions. This led to the uh, recommendations uh, or the new guidelines of the WHO uh, published uh, during the World Hepatitis Day in 2020, looking at triple elimination of uh, both hepatitis B, HIV, and syphilis, and uh, also looking at treatment of mothers, recommending treatment of mothers with tenofovir prophylaxis at the 28th week of pregnancy if the HBV DNA is more than 200,000 international units per mil, and using the uh, uh, H hepatitis B timely birth dose vaccination within the 24 hours as a key performance indicator, and of course, giving the hepatitis B immunoglobulin in addition, if available in some countries. So the conclusions for treatment vaccination for prevention is the most effective way to control infection. Majority of children with chronic infection have high viral loads, and normal ALTs are not responsive, responsive to current therapy. therapy should be considered for therapy. We should always remember that we need to test women in the childbearing age and screen women in the childbearing age even before they get married or get pregnant. Screening is a key to elimination of hepatitis B and maternal antiviral treatment and infant post-exposure prophylaxis. The full beneficial effects though of universal and birth dose vaccination will not be seen in Africa before two to three decades. Now we have almost 70 million infected, 1.4 million diagnosed, 20 eligible for treatment, but only 33, 700,000 
treated, less than 1% access therapy, less than 1% of pregnant women treated, and around 3.4% prevalence in children five years old, 19% only received the birth dose and 10% the timely vaccination. So we need to push very hard. I would uh, like to uh, hopefully incentivize and push all of you to uh, push your governments to start the birth dose and start the universal screening for pregnant women for S antigen or for S antigen, HIV and syphilis, and also to integrate within the universal health coverage including awareness and education and improving the state of lower tier healthcare facilities serving rural areas and investing in the health of African mothers. Community and civil society engagement, and this year it was all about um, the World Hepatitis Alliance, Fine Diagnostics, WHO, it was all about uh, mothers, women's health and prevention, mother to child transmission, and we need to simplify the diagnostic algorithm and address our research gap particularly in Africa. So as mentioned earlier, engagement of key stakeholders and prioritization of pregnant women in the cascade of viral hepatitis is key to elimination. And to conclude, we need to tailor the prevention of mother to child transmission according to our setting with optimal implementation of birth dose, timely implementation, uh, vaccination, uh, also treating women with high viral loads prevention of infections in girls and women living with HIV, and we can integrate into the HIV programs and in the harm reduction programs for the persons who are injecting drugs, and then simplify the diagnostics and improve access to affordable treatment. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, and now the live panel discussion will take place uh, uh, in Zoom. So to access this, please click on the Zoom link on the right side of the page under session information. And uh, please remember to return to this platform after the live panel discussion has ended. The panel discussion will be moderated by Professor uh, Jeffrey Dushikiwu from the UK.